let's talk about the SSH protocol. So this was first developed in 1995 by Tatu Ulanen, and I know I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but he was first inspired to develop this protocol after he discovered that there was a password sniffer being used on his Finnish university's network. So you see SSH, it stands for Secure Shell. Before its invention, people would have typically been using connections like Telnet or our login to administer remote machines. But the problem with Telnet and our login is that they are not secure at all. The packets that are sent with these network protocols are all sent in the clear. Now, back in the early 90s before SSH was invented, because with Telnet, I think that that was invented in the early 70s, uh, you know, these kinds of connections that were being made at the time being unencrypted wasn't really that big of a concern because the internet wasn't really fleshed out that much. So most of the time, if you were connecting to a so-called remote machine, it still would have typically been on the same network. You know, maybe it's a server that's located somewhere else in the building of a campus, but as things progressed and people started sending more and more connections over the internet, over a much larger network where anybody could be listening in between, well, you can probably see how plain text connections would be a problem in this day and age since these connections are oftentimes used to administer really important machines like servers that might have a website running on them. And you have the administrators who have to enter some kind of a username or password to do work on those machines. So if somebody gets those credentials, then it can really wreak some havoc. So it's very important to use a secure connection whenever you're on an insecure network. And even when you're dealing with local networks, really, because uh, it can be pretty hard to know for sure if your local network is secure when you have a whole lot of people using it and a whole lot of devices running on it. I mean. In this example, the password sniffer was being used on the university's network, right? So with SSH, we are encrypting the data that is being sent over a network. So if somebody is going to be sniffing this traffic, because there's really nothing that we can do to prevent someone from sniffing it, uh, they're copying our packets and trying to inspect them, they're not going to be able to see things like usernames and passwords to log into the remote machines. Now, of course, an adversary, they can still see that there is data being transmitted. So they could tell, okay, this person is making an SSH connection. They can see the frequency of those packets that are being sent and they can see how many of them are being sent. So there are some inferences that an adversary could make if they're listening in on this connection, but not a whole lot more. It's kind of like if you were to look outside and notice that your neighbor is getting a whole bunch of packages delivered to their house. You could speculate about what they are or what they might be doing. Maybe they're building a new PC or something, but you can't see inside the boxes, so you can't know for sure. Now let's get a bit more technical because SSH, it does more than just encrypt your data. Let's take a look at how the SSH connections are set up and what the packets themselves look like. So when you initiate an SSH connection, you first are establishing a TCP connection between the two machines. Well, usually. You can technically do SSH over something like WebSockets, but generally you're gonna be using TCP. Now for the packet itself, at the beginning of it is the packet length, which is four bytes in size, and it simply tells us how big the packet is going to be. Then you have another byte, which tells us how much padding the packet is going to have. Then you have the payload. So this is the actual data that you want. And then you have the actual padding. So this isn't the padding size. This is what we were referring to before we were talking about how big the padding is. Uh, and it can vary. That's why we define the amount at the beginning. Now to explain this padding simply, it's just random bytes that don't have any real meaning other than to be combined with the payload and then have the whole thing encrypted in order to make it harder for somebody who is sniffing this traffic to detect exactly what is going on. Like I mentioned earlier, the encryption just makes it so that you can't read the data plainly, but you can still try to infer things 
from the amount of data being transferred and how it's being transferred. So the padding makes this a bit more difficult to do. I guess it's sort of like if your neighbor had decoy packages on their porch mixed in with the real ones. And then you have at the end a message authentication code, which is sometimes called a tag, which is used to validate the authenticity of the package. Uh, basically, it tells the recipient that none of the data in the packet had been tampered with along the way. And also some kind of compression is oftentimes applied to the payload so that you can send more data without having to use more bandwidth because chances are that's going to be the bottleneck here in the connection is the bandwidth. So this is the plain text structure, but then when the packet is encrypted, all that anybody that is in the middle listening to this communication can read is the packet length and then the message authentication code. Now the particular encryption that is used for all of this is negotiated between the client and the server. Of course, either the client or the server could configure their preferences to disable the use of weaker encryption algorithms, and that's actually an ongoing recommendation as different encryption methods become obsolete over time. And this process is then repeated for multiple packets in a continuous way so that your communications are, well, your communications, of course, are always going to be made up of many, many packets. So this is that they're all going in the right order and nothing's getting messed up. Now, on top of this, you also have a series of channels that are being opened between your machine and the server. And what this enables you to do is to have multiple connections between you and the server at once. Like if your terminal has tabs or if you open up multiple terminals, if it doesn't have tabs for whatever reason, and you might have multiple connections to the same server. So maybe you have one that's uploading some data, another one downloading, and another one that you're actually really just using the shell and like some kind of terminal-based text editor to change configurations and then maybe you're saving and then restarting some services whatnot and you could also have a fourth connection going acting as like an ssh tunnel so taking something that would normally be encrypted or normally not encrypted and then tunneling it through ssh so all of this is made possible and it can be done at once with the multiplexing so ssh actually has a lot to it that you might not have previously thought about or known about and another cool thing that you could do with it, particularly in a Linux environment, is you could have X11, which is basically the core windowing system for Linux operating systems. Well, there's Wayland now too, which maybe you can do over SSH, uh, but X is still more widely used. Anyway, it's possible to forward X11 over SSH, which means um, that allows you to run graphical applications on a remote machine over that SSH connection. So pretty cool, right? And then of course there's the tunneling that I mentioned earlier, which uh, can let you do things over an encrypted tunnel through SSH. Or if you wanted to connect to a service behind a firewall, you might also accomplish that with SSH tunneling. So that wraps up this summary for how SSH works. If you found this video useful, be sure to leave a like, comment, and share the video with your friends, as well as subscribe to my Odyssey channel for more great videos, and you have a great rest of your day.